Hello, everyone. Welcome to Self Concept Part One. So, we have been talking a lot about ideas of cognition, right? So, we talked about cognition, we talked about thought process, how we understand schemas, etc. Then, we started talking about ideas of, of uh, cognitive dissonance, right? That, that idea that these thoughts can be in conflict with, um, with our actions or even with each other, and that creates problems for us, etc. But now, we need to talk generally how we understand who we are at all, right? And what does the social aspect of psychology have to do with understanding who we are, right? So I'm talking about me understanding who I am, right? So who is Ryan Curtis? That, that is the question that's in my brain. And what does the social aspect of psychology have to do with me coming to a conclusion of who I am? Now, a lot of the stuff that we're gonna talk about actually builds on this idea, the concept of a schema that we have about ourselves. And if you remember in cognitive dissonance, one of the main ways that we experience cognitive dissonance is when a belief about ourselves is in contrast with a behavior that we have done. And so the social aspect of understanding who we are is actually really important. I think a lot of people sit there and think, oh, you know what, I am who I am. And you know what, other people can't tell me who I'm gonna be. And good for them, good, good for them if they believe that, but boy, other people and the social situation really affect who you think you are and how you understand yourself all the time. All right, let's let's give you some examples on what I'm talking about. So when think when somebody thinks about themselves, there are a few different things that they talk about. So let's go ahead and ask you a question. Who are you? So write me a tweet, right? Short, like two, three sentences. Who are you? Now, when you wrote that, you were thinking about a lot of different things about your identity, okay? Maybe, uh, maybe just your name, maybe, um, maybe some other aspect, uh, your race, your gender. Uh, maybe it's about uh, your relationships with other people. I am, a, you know, a father, that kind of a thing, a sister, a brother. Um, maybe it's uh, I am smart or a trait that you have. But what you chose to put down as who you are actually is influenced by a lot of different things and stuff that you may not be even considering. So first, let's talk about the idea of a self-concept. So what you wrote down is, is part of at least your self-concept. It's the collection of beliefs and attitudes about yourself. The best way to think about this, or one way at least to think about this, is important is as a self-schema. You remember the concept of schema? Schema is all the collections of ideas and beliefs, et cetera, about a thing. Well, guess what? You have a schema about yourself, right? That, just like other schemas, can be made more accessible, less accessible, can be influenced by other things. There's lots of stuff going on when you create a schema of yourself. You love to think about yourself. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to accuse you of being a narcissist or something like that, but humans in general, we really like thinking about ourselves. Not, not that we, you know, not that we're, we love ourselves all the time. I hope that you love and care about yourself, but a lot of people want to know who they are to other people and are constantly evaluating themselves. Sometimes you have not negative and sometimes you have positive points of view, but what you're doing is you're actively trying to compile information that you'd put in your self schema because it turns out you are really important to yourself. Before we have this idea of self, one thing that we really need to understand is that not all organisms understand themselves as a self. Now, I know you're a human, and so this is really strange for you to understand, but we, we meaning science, believes that there's, there's an aspect of understanding who you are that is unique to at least certain species. What we're really talking about is the idea of self-awareness and the theory of mind. So I'll, I'll get back to the idea of metac metacognition and looking glass self in just a second, but the self-awareness and the theory of mind. The first step is that an organism must understand that it is separate from other organisms of the same species or any other species for that matter, right? So the idea, and, and I know that you don't have a problem with this because humans figure this out pretty quick, but what we're saying is that doesn't, does, a, does a honeybee or an ant really understand that they are an individual that is unique and different from all the other honeybees or all the other ants? That is self-awareness. Self-awareness is the idea that I I'm aware that I am a unique individual. I'm separate from other, other entities. In order to, to test this, Gallup and others, uh, this is the recognizing yourself in the mirror idea. So one test of self-awareness that we, we use for humans as well as other animals is we put you in front of a, a mirror 
And then subtly, we put some makeup on your nose or on your forehead or on your cheek, okay? Now, you don't, you're not aware that this has happened, but then we put you in front of a mirror. And when you're in front of the mirror, you look at it. And if you were aware of yourself, if you're aware that you are an entity separate, for example, from the entity, uh, from a separate entity, you understand that this image in the mirror is a representation of you that is unique and different, then you would probably investigate your own body as, you know, to, to figure out how to wipe off that mark, that makeup. But animals that don't have a sense of self will do other things. Like, for example, they'll try and wipe the make off, makeup off of the animal in the mirror. Or they might try and attack the animal in the mirror, for example, because they, at least in this test of sense of self-awareness, don't have a sense of self as them being separate from other people. Theory of mind is the next step. You can have self-awareness and not have a theory of mind. Theory of mind is the idea that I have a theory that you have a mind. Now, I know that sounds weird, but here's the idea. It's, it's the sense that I am aware that you have your own mind, your own point of view. Now, I can know that I'm separate from everybody else, but still not really understand that we all have different points of view and different minds of our own. This is actually developed after self-awareness. Uh, for humans, we assume that it happens around four years old to really uh, develop a theory of mind. And so what this means is that allows us to have what's called metacognition. Cognition is thinking, right? Processing information. Metacognition is cognition about cognition. It's the fact that you can think about your own thoughts and your own cognitions. You can think about how you're thinking about yourself. Now, not all organisms, at least most scientists believe that not all organisms can do this. Not all organisms can say, hey, I think that I have an image, a concept, uh, a, a reputation, for example, that other people have of me. You as a human are really interested in other people, the social aspect of the self, because you know that they have a point of view about you. They have an opinion about who you are. They can make a judgment about you, right? They have theory of mind and, and stuff. And with your metacognition, you can say, oh, I bet that they are making a judgment about me. I bet that they have an opinion about me. This leads us to under, understand ourselves through the point of view of other people. Now, follow, this is pretty easy, right? So do you feel good about yourself? Well, you know, if a bunch of people are making fun of you and they don't like you, a lot of times you don't feel good about yourself. Well, that requires quite a bit of psychology to be able to get to that point. You have to be able to understand that other people have their own point of view. And then you have to be able to think about the way you're thinking about your own identity and realize that they have their own point of view and then you take that on. We really rely on our social environment to understand ourselves. In fact, there's a famous statement that's called the looking glass self. And it's the idea that we come to know ourselves by imagining what others are thinking about us. This requires metacognition on our own part and also the theory of mind that other people have their own point of view and can make a judgment about us. And this is a really influential way that we as humans understand who we are. So I understand who Ryan Curtis is partially by understanding or at least attempting to understand how other people see me, right? Whether or not my wife actually likes me, whether or not the guy next door thinks I'm cool, all that stuff is in contributing to my self schema, my self concept. Besides just the idea of metacognition and understanding what other people see or don't see about you, you should know that your culture probably has a lot of effect as to how you understand yourself. So let's talk about the difference between independent and interdependent self. The idea here is that there are certain cultures which we call collectivistic or individualistic. In the Western, in, in the United States specifically, in other parts of the world, in Western Europe, for example, and other places, we have what's generally understood to be a pretty individualistic kind of a culture, that a lot of the focus of what's important is on the individual, about me, right? And that's quite different than other places in the world where they're gonna have more of a collectivistic culture, where the understanding of the self is, is part of an interdependent group or community. Now there's a traditional, uh, traditionally you would think of uh, places like East Asia as being quite high 
an interdependent self, high in this collectivistic kind of an idea, collectivistic culture. And what that means is what's important to understanding who you are depends on the, the group and where you fit into the group. That would be more of a collectivistic or in, interdependent idea. Let me give you an example. So one study found that when, when you ask uh, Americans, North Americans, meaning the United States, about who they are, they will often give you information like, I love my family, I want to be a nurse, I often work out in the gym, I bought a t-shirt today, I'm good at math, I'm not a racist, I'm good at sports, right? So notice how there's a lot of focus on the I, right? There's a lot of focus on me and what I am. Compare that to a Japanese uh, a Japanese sample, and here's a lot of things that they talk about. Now, notice that there's a lot of I's, but notice how these I's talk about their place in a group. So I'm the youngest child in my family. I'm a human being. I visited my grandfather yesterday. I'm in a psychology class. I'm against Japanese troops going to Cambodia. I'm not able to play an instrument, musical instrument well. These focus more, the Japanese sample tend to focus more about their relationship with other people, right? So for example, my relationship with my grandfather or my role in the class or my role in the family compared to specific traits or specific desires or goals or behaviors that are individualistic. So your culture, whether or not you realize it, will actually frame how you think of who you are, right? Your own self-concept depends on what the culture actually values. And generally in the United States, the culture tends to be pretty individualistic where people focus a lot about themselves and less about their role in a group, a community or a collective. So how do you know what you like and what you don't like? Now, if you remember, we talked a lot about the, the idea of attitudes in the past, right? The idea of attitudes. When we're talking about social, uh, uh, excuse me, cognitive dissonance, we talked about attitudes. How do you know what you like? How do you know what you don't like? How do you know about yourself? Well, one important way that you do this is through introspection. Introspection, intro, inside, inspection, seeing, right? Just seeing inside yourself, looking inside yourself to see, hey, what do I like? What do I not like? Do I like corn dogs or not like corn dogs? Do I like this? Do I not like that? And often what we're looking for is evidence of your personality saying, oh, this is the way I am. This is what I like and this is what I don't like. And I have good reasons for why that is. We often underestimate environmental or social cues when we do this introspection. What do I mean by that? Well, let's talk about it. Introspection means you know because you think about it and you feel it, right? So you're looking at, hey, why do I like this? Why do I like that? It's you introspecting, saying, ah, I think it's because, you know, I really like the taste and flavor of the corn dog in combination with the other things and all that stuff. And you just ignore other stuff, other random things that could be influencing whether you like something. One example of this is implicit egotism. Implicit egotism is the idea that you just like yourself. And so there are some things that you just like because it's somehow associated with you. Now you'd say, well, doesn't that make sense? Well, I'm talking about really subtle ways. So one of the, the, uh, the main focuses of, of uh, implicit egotism is that people will often like stuff just because it starts with the same letter as their name or because it sounds like their name. So for example, Statistically, it has been found in certain studies that there are more people who are named Dennis who are dentists than should be statistically you know, real, right? That should be by chance. The idea is that people named Dennis like the idea of, hey, I am Dennis and things that are associated or at least rhyme with or start with the same letters as Dennis are therefore more valuable to me because they're similar to me. If you ask somebody who's named Dennis, who's a dentist, hey, are you a dentist because you like the letters D, E, and N? They're gonna say no, it's because I like uh, working with people and I like healthcare and I like to make enough money to take care of myself and my family. They're not gonna, they're gonna give you introspection ideas. They're not gonna go out there and say, oh, it's implicit egotism, it just happens to be D, E, N, that's how it goes. Now, to be fair, implicit egotism has uh, had a little bit of trouble uh, in replication and so this may need to, we may need to work on implicit egotism specifically, but the idea of things in your environment affecting how you process the information and make judgments about yourself is not just implicit egotism. Let me give you an example. 
So Kruglansky and his colleagues uh, did a study where they asked people, how much do you like these socks? So they're at a store, right? And so they're, it's like a, an opinion survey. They got a bunch of socks on a board and they say, okay, I want you to feel the socks. There's a bunch of different socks here. Feel the socks, touch them, et cetera. Tell me which ones you like the most. Well, in reality, all of those socks were exactly the same. They're made of the same stuff, the same brand, et cetera, right? It turns out that people tended to like the, the things on the right, the right two socks in this, this row of socks, they like the right two. When you ask them, why do you like those socks? They would give you introspective kind of answers. They'll say, oh, I really like the feel. I really like the touch. I really like, you know, the way that this, you know, fits just slightly different. In reality, they just like whatever's on the right because people tend to be right-handed and they just reached out and whatever happened to be on the right was there. That was it. All the introspection that they did really wasn't accurate. Why? Because they were exactly the same sock. They're made out of the same stuff. They, they were same size. Everything was the same. The only thing that was different is the order they were presented in. But people like reasons why they prefer something, why they have opinions, why they do what they do. They often ignore just the social randomness of the situation. And they try and say, hey, this is why. Introspection, my personality, this is why. This can often be associated with what we've talked about with affect forecasting, right? Hey, how are you gonna feel when you graduate? How are you gonna feel when your significant other dumps you, et cetera? You're like, oh, it's gonna be bad, it's awful, et cetera, thing because I'm such a caring person and I love my, my significant other, et cetera, which I'm not saying that you don't, but what I'm saying is you're ignoring the idea that you're really not a very good introspector right? You're not very good at understanding how you process information. You're pretty good at coming up with reasons. Now, whether they're accurate is a separate issue. So let's ask you this question. Would you study psychology if you weren't getting college credit for it? Now, the idea here is intrinsic versus extrinsic rewards as to why we do stuff. So if you think about why do I do what I do, my self-concept says, hey, you know what? I love psychology and I'm gonna do it because I love it, right? That's an intrinsic motivation for why I would do what I would do. Extrinsic motivation would be somebody saying, hey, I'll give you, uh, I'll give you 20 bucks to, to do your homework in psychology, or I'll give you college credit. Now you're not doing it because you just love it, you're doing it because you're getting a reward. So one of the most famous um, studies on this has to do uh, with Lepper et al. in their 1973 study about coloring. So they got little kids and they got little kids and they put them into three groups, all right? Now it turns out that little kids like coloring. The vast majority of little kids like to color, just crayons and pencils, that's what I'm talking about, just coloring. They like to color, they'll color pictures, right? So here's what they'll do. They'll say, all right, will you please color this picture? All right. Now we've got three groups. You're going to color your picture for a while. Everybody does that to begin with. Then they're put into three separate groups. In one of the groups, they show their picture and the, uh, the researcher or the teacher, whoever it is, says, oh, that's great. And gives them a sticker on their picture. Okay, then the other two groups don't get any sticker. All right, okay. Then we do this again. We offer the kids the opportunity to color and we watch and time how long they take coloring with these brand new markers that they were excited to do about before. The kids who got the reward the first time, the sticker, and we're expecting a reward the second time they colored. If they didn't get a reward, they would spend less time coloring. However, there is another group which they were coloring. They didn't get a sticker. They colored the second time and they got a sticker. It was an unexpected reward. 
versus a control group, which had no reward at all. So here's what's going on. The kids who got the sticker initially said, ooh, I really like the sticker, mentally. They don't say it out loud. But mentally, they're saying, hey, I'm getting reward. I'm getting this sticker for, for doing this coloring. I like that sticker. I'm going to color so I can get more stickers. But when they didn't get the sticker again, they spent less time coloring. You contrast that to other kids who didn't get a sticker, weren't expecting a sticker, and they colored and they got a sticker randomly. Okay, In both groups, they got a sticker. It's just a matter of what they expected or didn't expect. So what you see on the y-axis there is how much time they spent actually coloring. It turns out that the kids who got the sticker, an extrinsic motivation, extrinsic means outside of me, right? Extrinsic motivation spent less time doing the behavior if they were not given that extrinsic motive, right? They spent less time coloring if they didn't get a sticker. Once they started expecting the sticker, they stopped doing as much coloring. The kids who didn't expect the sticker spent a lot more time coloring. So what does this have to do with you? Well, sometimes we do things not because of intrinsic motivation, but because we are given rewards. Grades, for example, college credit, maybe, money, perhaps. And this evidence seems to say that when we are given the extrinsic motivation, somehow that takes away our intrinsic motivation to actually perform the task. So when we say, would you take psychology even if you were not given college credit? Well, that would require you to do intrinsic motivation. You would have to intrinsically just want to do it. Some people would argue that by me giving you a grade or college credit, you actually it actually undermines your desire to learn about the subject. You are then more concerned about getting the grade or the college credit and less about really understanding how psychology works. Okay, so we've talked about introspection. Now we need to talk about self-perception and self-perception theory. Self-perception theory is that we make judgments about what we like or don't like. We make judgments about our attitudes, not necessarily about by introspection, thinking about how we're thinking about things, but instead by looking at our own behaviors. So here is a, a, an example of how that would work. So let's say that you, um, you, are, uh, you go home for Thanksgiving, right? And uh, your mom, or your dad, whoever it is like, oh, honey, so glad to see you. Let me take your dirty laundry and do it all for you and, and be nice to you. Go sit down and watch, uh, watch TV and have some snacks while I do all the work for you, right? That's exactly what you want to happen. So you go in there and uh, on the table, your mom has put a bowl of uh, bugles. You don't, I don't know if you know those little the bugles, those little snacks are like kind of like chips, but they're bugles. Anyway, let's say that you've never had bugles before, right? You never had them before. So you're watching TV and you're eating these bugles. Okay, your brother comes in and says, hey, welcome back. Good to see you. Hey, do you like those bugles? Now, you haven't really been thinking about it. It's not been introspection. You're not sitting there saying, let me process all of the information about how I feel and think. Instead, what you do is you look down at the bowl. It's three quarters of the way empty. You said, whoa, I ate a bunch. I must really like it. Self-perception is when we decide our attitudes, what we like and what we don't like based off of our own behavior. So self-perception theory is when we base our attitudes off of our own behaviors. Here's another way to think about it. So uh, you are hanging out with some people, right? So you're hanging out with Joe and uh, you're you know, hanging out doing stuff, et cetera. And then your friend comes by and says, hey, do you have a crush on Joe? And you haven't really thought about it before, but you look back and you're like, wow, I spent every waking moment with Joe for the last month. <gasps> I'm in love with Joe. That's self-perception theory. Self-perception because you base your attitude about Joe on your behavior, spending every waking moment with Joe. The other one that we need to talk about is social comparison theory. And I don't know if you noticed how excited I started to get. Remember Leon Festinger? Leon Festinger, the same guy who did Cognitive Dissonance? He's the one who really championed social comparison theory. And social comparison theory, boy, it's a big deal. 
now more than ever, in my opinion, especially with social media going on. Let's talk about social comparison theory. Let me ask you some questions. So here we go. So what we're going to do is I want you to tell me your birth month, whether it's odd or even. I'm going to put you into different groups. Okay. So tell me your birth month, odd or even. All right. You told me that you told me that your birth month was even. You told me that your birth month was even. So here's what I want you to do. Tell me how attractive you are on a scale from one to seven. One being unattractive, seven being very attractive. All right, you told me that your birth month was odd. So tell me how physically attractive you think you are with from one to seven, with one being unattractive and seven being extremely attractive. Okay. Here is what we just did. I just split you into two groups. In one group, I showed you the picture on the left. The other group, I showed you the picture on the right. When we answer the question, how attractive am I? We're making a judgment about ourself, right? Our own self-concept, our own you know, capacity or ability or uh, characteristic. And how do we determine that? Well, one way, one important way is by comparing ourselves to other people. What we've found is that it depends. How attractive you are actually depends on who you're comparing yourself to. If you're comparing yourself to someone who's extremely attractive, then you're probably less attractive. If you're comparing yourself to someone who's unattractive, then you're probably more attractive. What we're saying is that your attractiveness is depends. It changes. It depends on who you're comparing, comparing yourself to, a social comparison. So when I ask something like, uh, so social comparison is that people learn about their attitudes and their abilities by comparing themselves with other people. You do this. Like, so for, let's say that you uh, get your exam score back. What do you do? Well, the first thing you do is you ask, well, you look at it, right? But you ask the people next to you, how well did you do? Why are you doing that? Because you want to know, is this a good score? Let's say that you got an 80% on the exam. Is 80% a good score or is it a bad score? Well, if everybody else got a 95%, it's not a very good score. If everybody else got a 65%, then it's a great score. So when you try to even start to understand, you know, how smart am I? How able am I at doing school? How good of a student am I? What you actually do is you figure that out through social comparison. Social comparison. We do this all the time. We do this all the time. So when do we do it and with whom? So here's the real issue. We, according to the theory, social comparison theory, we specifically do the social comparison when we do not have an objective standard, okay? When we don't have an objective standard or when we feel uncertain about, a, about something. I would actually contend that objective standards are pretty rare, right? It's, it's kind of hard. It, 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 it's kind of hard. Uh, to figure that out. So maybe there's objective standards like, hey, you got into college and that's compared to the whole population. That means that you must be pretty good at school. But what happens is you don't consider that necessarily objective, even though it is technically an objective standard. You start to say, oh, well, I'm actually comparing myself with other people in college now. And so therefore, I must not be very smart. Let me give you an example. When I ask you, how smart are you? It depends on who you're thinking about. So if I ask you how smart are you compared to Albert Einstein, that's what we call an upward social comparison. Albert Einstein's pretty smart. He's smarter than you. And so if the person you're comparing yourself to is extremely intelligent, then you say, ooh, boy, how smart am I? Albert Einstein's really smart. Uh, I'm a two, I'm not very smart. But if I compare you to, now, so you should know that there's jokes about poor Claudia Schiffer, who, uh, who was, had jokes about how un unintelligent she is. And yes, I think that does propagate stereotypes specifically about women and perhaps even blonde women. 
she is known, though, at least stereotypically, for not being intelligent. So if, if that is your schema, and I'm not saying it should be, if that is your schema about Claudia Schiffer, and I ask, how smart are you? And you're like, wow, compared to Claudia Schiffer, I'm really smart. Because you are doing a downward social comparison. You're comparing yourself with someone who's less capable than you at this particular topic, and that is smart. Now, in reality, the smartness that you have is the same. But the evaluation that you have about yourself changes depending on who you're comparing yourself to. An upward social comparison means you're comparing yourself to someone who has more of or is better at this particular topic. A downward social comparison is when you're comparing yourself to someone who is less than or doesn't have as much of a specific characteristic. I believe that social media, and there's a lot of evidence to say that social media is just a hotbed of social comparison. Especially, this can be especially bad though, because people will uh, compare themselves to an Instagram post or a Snapchat or whatever it happens to be, which is not realistic. Now here's one major problem with this whole thing. You are good at social comparison. And when you look at this Instagram post, you're not considering it as an Instagram post that has been, you know, meticulously manicured the person looks exactly right the lighting is perfect you know they've thought about their outfit they've gotten rid of everybody around them etc you're not doing that when you compare yourself to that person instead you're thinking about oh man i haven't gotten out of bed all day today and all i ate was a box of oatmeal cream pies and and i haven't gotten out of my pajamas oh look at me oh social comparison you're like oh i'm not very good or attractive because everybody on instagram is posting all this great stuff that's not particularly fair because what is being shown to you is not an accurate representation of that person's life it is one very doctored instance of it even worse when it's literally doctored literally photoshopped uh, for example and you're making your comparison to someone who is not real at all. We do a lot of social comparison. We make a lot of evaluations about ourselves based off of what, based off of comparing ourselves to other people. And it's an important source of information about our self-concept, but boy, it's not very accurate all the time. 